Welcome back for week 11 of Poll 3 IPC, where this week we'll be exploring the role of First Nations peoples in, inter in the international politics of climate change. Now, by way of introduction, I want to draw on the works of Manuela Peake, Jeff Corn Tassel, and Mark Wounds to highlight three specific ways in which First Nations perspectives problematize state-centric global climate politics. And then we'll go into that much further through the video. But first, Peake, Corn Tassel, and Wounds argue that First Nations perspectives challenge the state's ultimate authority by asserting their authority over their nations, lands and waters and the natural world. So there's an indigenous so sovereignty, state sovereignty uh, challenge here that's going on. Second, they argue that First Nations perspectives expose the colonial foundations of the state-centric system. And we've explored this previously and we'll touch on this again here. So this owes its existence to the processes of colonization and the eradication of indigenous identities and relationships to land, and even the attempted eradication of First, First Nations peoples themselves. Third, First Nations peoples' worldviews and practices challenge us to imagine what it might be like to share power within and think beyond state borders and the prevailing global system. So this is an invitation to explore alternative Earth-based governance models that are more appropriate for the challenges of the Anthropocene. So I'll progress this video first by looking at First Nations sovereignty, then look at traditional knowledge systems and climate responses. I'll then touch on First Nations and environmental treaties and finish off by looking at Earth-based governance models, sovereignty struggles and self-determination. The term First Nations recognises the political and cultural sovereignty of Indigenous communities, and it encompasses a tremendous diversity of different people and cultures from around the world. The UN puts the number of First Nations in the thousands. The term itself came into use in Canada in the 1970s and has since been more broadly adopted globally, both in the UN system and in international activist networks. Considering the diversity of First Nations peoples, an official definition of First Nations hasn't been adopted per se by any UN system body. Instead, the UN has embraced a broad understanding of the term based on a number of characteristics, and these include self-identification and historical continuity with pre-colonial societies, strong link to territories and surrounding natural resources, distinct social, economic and political systems, distinct language, culture and beliefs, but also that they form non-dominant groups in settler societies. And within that context, they resolve to maintain and reproduce their ancestral environments and systems as distinctive peoples and communities from the dominant state. States, on the other hand, are constructed around different principles of territorial sovereignty and legally recognized governmental systems and have historically sought to control, coerce, and even eliminate First Nations peoples from the landscape. The existing dominant framework of interstate relations roots itself in state sovereignty. That's the dominant organizing paradigm. From a First Nations perspective, this has been established through violence, through broken treaties, and other unjust assertions of power over indigenous peoples and their lands. This means that the modern international relations system, including its institutions, its norms and principles, are deeply embedded in colonialism. And therein lies an unavoidable tension point when we're analysing this topic. Even so, through the 20th century, many First Nations globally attempted to reassert and reclaim their authority through the principle of national self-determination which has developed as a norm in international relations since the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 at the conclusion of World War I. The Versailles Conference was an important watershed moment that weakened the grip of European empires on the world and carved out a potential pathway to decolonization. Self-determination provides an avenue for First Nations to create political entities that can be recognized by the international community within the state system setup. The process is based on the idea that people should be free to form their own governments and control their own affairs, which is central to the ethics and legality that underpins the United Nations. 
There are a number of examples of a colonising states or the settler colonial states that they birthed to form treaties with the indigenous peoples of the lands that they colonised. And here, Aotearoa New Zealand and Canada and the United States are good examples. Aotearoa New Zealand has the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi, which is pictured here on the bottom left. As you can see in a larger map, this is Canada. Canada has a series of 11 treaties with its First Nations. And the United States has signed a series of treaties with different Native American nations through the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, don't get me wrong, these treaties have had significant limitations or even been flat out ignored by the settler governments. They are nonetheless legal instruments under international law that give nation status to the indigenous peoples involved. This provides a greater legal space for autonomous governance and the potential for self-determination within the dominant framework of state sovereignty. Now, Australia, on the other hand, has never entered into a treaty either with individual Aboriginal nations or with any collective entity representing Aboriginal nations on this continent. So in the Australian case, journalist Nat Crom has argued in Indigenous X that at the crux of any sovereignty discussion is a necessity to distinguish Indigenous sovereignty from state sovereignty. So Crom goes on to say that Indigenous sovereignty isn't about ruling or governing a country per se, a la the state sovereignty model. Indigenous sovereignty is more about acknowledging the role of Indigenous peoples as custodians of the land since time immemorial and caring for that land and the communities on it as core elements of national self-determination. However, you will have heard the phrase sovereignty never ceded, uh, perhaps in a welcome to country or acknowledgement of country ceremony. So this means that the indigenous nations in Australia have never officially ceded their sovereignty over the land in the European understanding of the term and that indigenous nations have defined territories with economy, with populations that have bloodline heritages of birth and death registry through their totemic relationships and external trade relationships with other nations. So all of these things are argued are fundamental ingredients that establish self-governing peoples in a nation state as described by modern international law. And this is part of the justification for the Aboriginal tent embassy in Canberra, which was established uh, in the early 1970s as a symbol uh, of this nationalism. The assertion of Indigenous sovereignty in Australia is the necessary step towards negotiating a formal treaty with the Australian government, which would in turn enshrine a governance structure for Indigenous people that would be controlled by Indigenous people for Indigenous people in a parallel structure with the Australian Federation. I want to now talk about traditional knowledge systems because this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of linking Indigenous or First Nations sovereignty to climate change. So all First Nations have their own sets of experiences and explanations relating to their ancestral lands. Different cultures have different ways and experiences of social reality, influenced by their worldview and the socioeconomic and ecological context of their livelihood in place. So these culturally and locally specific ways of knowing and specific locally specific ways of knowledge production are often referred to as traditional ecological community, local knowledge systems and so on. So together, these things constitute traditional knowledge systems and they include sophisticated arrays of information and understanding and interpretation that guide how they relate to place, how they relate to country. So there's a very intimate relationship with place here. Now, the foundation of all knowledge systems is local, but due to the unbalanced power relations stemming from colonialism and empire, colonial powers universally impose their knowledge systems and their cultures and languages across the rest of the world. And just a, a quick example of this, this is why English is the common dominant language of diplomacy and global trade and why we do science and academia the way we do, because these are European imports that have become global through that colonial expansion. Now, I recommend the work of the Jamaican critical race theorist Charles Mills on the racial contract. Mills goes into this in far more detail. 
But this erasure of traditional knowledge systems is highly problematic because critical understandings of how to live sustainably on country, how to live sustainably with the earth are being lost. While First Nations peoples as an umbrella term includes numerous diverse and different cultures, as I've said, there are some common characteristics of their respective traditional knowledge systems that are pertinent to our discussion. So from an ontological perspective, from a worldview perspective, the land is indivisible from the people that inhabit it through a deep interconnection that's entwined into all aspects of life and culture. Landscapes are alive, not only with those who are living, but also with the spirits of all the ancestors who've passed on and the spirits of other life forms. So in that context, humans are members of this extended family of life and have an important role to play as carers and custodians in relationship to that family. Responsibility for caring for this animated world is deeply coded into cultural practice and social organisation at a level of sophistication that's usually well beyond post-enlightenment knowledge systems of the industrial era. So building from the ground that we covered in the final section of last week's video, if you're looking for examples of long, long established systems of ecocentric governance, look no further than here. So with that understanding, we might then be able to comprehend the deep wound that colonization has inflicted in physically severing the connection between First Nations peoples and their land. It severs connection to culture and language, destroying the web of interconnecting relationships that connect people with each other and facilitate the care of landscapes. Settler societies have done enormous environmental damage because they've lacked this deep knowledge and the relationships of custodianship of the cultures that they replaced. Now let's think about the understanding of the relationship between people and place that's replaced traditional knowledge systems through colonization around the world. And let's rewind to our earlier discussion about the economy and com compare that with the ontology of capitalism, which sees the environment as a commodity for exploitation. Colonialism was accompanied by the enclosure of land and other resources for this transformation into products and profit. Now, I recommend a book called Caliban and the Witch by the Italian sociologist Silvia Federici who argues that enclosure and the violent alienation of people from the landscapes they lived in was a critical element to the formation of capitalism in both the colonies and the European core countries as well. So consider the concept of private property, which is a key epistemological principle of capitalism. Private property embodies a set of values and relationships to land that's based on exclusive rights to commodify or to build on the land and which objectifies any flora and fauna that live on land to the exclusion of all other people, to the exclusion of anyone who's a non-owner of that property, property. So it's an exclusive property right. Now as a thought exercise, think about the land that you live on right now. It will have been bought and sold many times before you got there. But if we trace that transaction history, at some stage, looking back, it was taken from the indigenous people who lived on that land and people who'd lived there previously for tens of thousands of years. And that pattern you can trace back across all settler colonial societies. There are institutionalized incentives in the domestic legal regime around private property ownership, which enshrine exploitation of landscapes rather than care of and custodianship of landscapes. Also recall my comparison between environmental treaties and economic treaties back in week four. And you can see very clearly that in that comparison that exploitation of the earth is incentivized rather than custodianship of the earth. Uh, so that's the incentivization of exploitation over custodianship uh, is very clearly demarcated in international law. So land dispossession has not only severed cultural connection to land, but it's also de deprived First Nations peoples of an economic base in the capitalist economy. And this has implications in the context of climate change. So on the mitigation side, the small economic footprint of First Nations peoples means they also tend to have a very small carbon footprint. However, their vulnerability to climate change impacts is disproportionately high because of intergenerational economic disadvantage, 
And this places real, very real limitations on the adaptive capacity of First Nations communities. In a climate context, these are the kinds of systemic issues that Indigenous sovereignty and autonomy over governance and decision making would directly address. In the vacuum, civil society NGOs and activist groups and mutual aid networks have moved in to fill this representational void and work on capacity building. So in Australia, for example, you've got the SEED Indigenous Youth Climate Network is a really good illustrative example among many. And ironically, the traditional knowledge systems of First Nations peoples could be really pivotal to the broader climate mitigation and adaptation project, in part because settler colonial societies have been so bad at environmental protection and taking care of country, which is one of the issues that underpins environmental pollution. But to cite one example, uh, and an Australian example, in the wake of last year's bushfires, we heard a lot about the practice of Aboriginal cultural burning. So in the mainstream press, it was described as a means of reducing bushfire risk through fuel reduction. However, fuel reduction, as I understand it, is not at all the primary objective of cultural burning. Cultural burns are done by indigenous custodians or people given their permission and guidance to do so. And the use of fire is specific to each location. It's specific to the animals and the flora uh, and the totemic and cultural value of specific places. So cultural burning in Melbourne will be different to cultural burning that takes place in other places around Victoria and around the, around the country. There are many interconnected, in object, interconnected objectives of cultural burning, including maintaining the health of country, including ceremony and habitat protection. Cultural burning is a practice that's deeply embedded in relationship to country, which itself is inextricably linked to the indigenous sovereignty struggle. So you can't have one without the other. Indeed, a foundational principle for fostering positive interactions between First Nations traditional knowledge holders and people in settler societies is that these collaborations have to be initiated through equality between equal partners. They need to be built on mutual respect and understanding, built on transparent and open dialogue, and the informed consent and just returns for Indigenous knowledge holders through the flow of rewards and benefits. So it would be extraordinarily unjust for non-Indigenous societies to commoditize knowledge systems from First Nations peoples, or to pick and choose specific techniques to implement within the context of the destructive worldview of colonialism removing traditional knowledge systems from their original connection to culture and place. So this is cultural appropriation, and that only perpetuates colonial patterns of dispossession. So the sharing of traditional knowledge systems needs to occur through the sovereign agency and consent of the First Nations peoples themselves. And more importantly, those knowledge systems are inextricably connected to the struggles of First Nations peoples for land sovereignty. First Nations have been largely denied agency and excluded from meaningful deliberation in international and national climate change mitigation regimes. And that's despite the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the local communities and Indigenous platform in the UNFCCC. Despite that, the voices of First Nations peoples are still comparatively weak when contrasted with those of their national governments or contrasted with the observers in the UNFCCC process from the corporate sector. So these two texts are symbolically important though in their declaration of the inalienable rights of First Nations peoples, even though they lack binding power. On the surface, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples appears to offer First Nations a power of veto over all matters that affect them, all matters that affect their communities and their territories, which would be a key to their national self-determination. However, many signatory states refused to adopt the declaration until it included limiting language that would cancel this veto power if it came into contact with the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. And this is articulated in Article 46 of the Declaration. So this is really the spoiler on the self-determination aspect. 
uh, of the declaration itself. There are other well-meaning international environmental instruments that have proven problematic for First Nations. And RED 2 Plus is a case in point. So RED 2 Plus stands for the United Nations Collaborative Program on Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation in Developing Countries. Obviously a mouthful, hence the acronym RED. Now RED was established in 2008 to sequester greenhouse gases in forests through enhanced forest management programs in developing countries. And it was designed to be a win-win for all parties where red-based forest management would generate carbon permits for First Nations foreign peoples that they could then sell on international emissions trading markets to generate income. However, the Red 2 Plus agenda has been problematic for forest dwelling Indigenous peoples and sovereignty again is an issue. So while the UN position is that forests constitute an important global ecological commons, the red governance architecture has been politically disempowering for the First Nations forest peoples it was meant to help, particularly in the Amazon basin. So on the ground, this has meant an erosion of land tenure rights for forest peoples, despite the fact that indigenous forest peoples are best positioned to care for forests through their traditional knowledge practices. Also, international carbon markets collapsed uh, in the immediate aftermath following the uh, constitution of RED. So the income generating potential wasn't there either. To quote the NGO Climate Justice Alliance from the US, a just nation to nation relationship means breaking the cycle of asking indigenous nations to choose between a colonial, colonial imposed model of an extractive economy or preservation of their indigenous sovereignty including protection of their traditional lands, waters and air, and the right to practice their spirituality and cultural life ways. So I think all of this is really illustrative. There's a clash of two different governance cultures within the UN, even where First Nations representation is a, a stated goal, as in the treaty instruments that we've just looked at. Now, a tip of the hat here to Dr. William Jonas, who was the former Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, now, in 2002, in a speech, he linked the legitimacy of state sovereignty in general as a norm with its treatment of First Nations peoples. So in this speech, Jonas argued that international law will generally support the claim of states to territorial integrity, but that this support comes with responsibilities and the obligation to be representative and inclusive of all of its citizens, including First Nations peoples. So while the current instruments of international law, international law concerning First Nations are relatively weak, there's an emerging consensus that the credibility and the legitimacy of a state's foundations, the legitimacy of its sovereignty, depends on its inclusivity and the way that it treats indigenous populations. So in other words, state sovereignty as a norm of international relations itself is evolving. The emergence of international instruments like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and like the local communities and indigenous platform in the UNFCCC, these provide an anchor point for the further evolution of the state sovereignty norm. So they're not unimportant. We see this evolution in other related areas of international law as well, including in the realm of human rights and the responsibility to protect. So there's other pressures on the state sovereignty norm that are forcing it in this direction as well. Let's get into Earth-based governance models now. Now, there have been some successful legal precedents set around the world where environments have been recognised as having legal rights of personhood. Now, legal personhood for landscapes and ecosystems is a huge development. It changes the social contract that's implied in state sovereignty between the state and its citizens, giving political representation to ecosystems and the non-human life forms that live within ecosystems, so in effect, that's reinterpreting what sovereign control over, over a defined territory means. The idea of an environmental entity existing as a legal person comes from the scholarship of Christopher Stone in the United States and the citation of Stone's work in the 1972 US Supreme Court case, Sierra Club versus Morton. 
Now, if it seems strange that an ecosystem could be given the legal rights of personhood, bear in mind that corporations were given legal rights of personhood in the US back in the 19th century. And this development laid the foundation for the dominant role of multinational corporations in the global economy today. Around the world, there have been a number of legal precedents that have established legal personhood for ecosystems. Ecuador was the first country to recognize rights of nature in its constitution. In 2007, Ecuador went through its citizens revolution, which saw Rafael Correa become the country's president on the back of an explicit anti-neoliberal agenda. The seventh chapter of this new constitution on the rights of nature recognizes Pachamama or Mother Earth as a legal entity and that any individual or group can petition on Pachamama's behalf under the law. Inspired by Ecuador, Bolivia also developed its own historic Mother Earth law under the leadership of President Evo Morales, who was the first indigenous president of Bolivia. The Mother Earth law gives legal rights to ecosystems and mandated a radical ecological transition of Bolivia's economy. It also recognized Mother Earth as a collective subject of public interest, which is another way of saying legal personhood. Now, bear in mind, however, that in Ecuador and Bolivia, these laws have been hotly contested by other political actors and business interests, particularly from mining and finance sectors. Both Rafael Correa in Ecuador and Evo Morales in Bolivia were later ousted in subsequent elections, although Morales has more recently returned to the presidency in Bolivia. There are other pertinent examples of ecocentric law as well. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Wanganui Maori Iwi people won a legal battle to recognize the legal personhood of their ancestral Wanganui River, which you can see in the video here. This law now treats the harming of the Wanganui River the same way as it would treat the harming of the Maori people themselves. Also in India, a series of judicial judgments have accorded rivers within the Ganges and Yamuna River basins with a similar legal personhood. Here also, people can petition the legal system on behalf of the rivers and on behalf of non-human life forms that live in them. Now remember I touched on the People's Agreement of Cochabamba last week, so let's revisit that. Along with its sister document, the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, both of which have been put forward as serious alternatives to the UNFCCC. These documents are both heavily influenced by traditional knowledge systems and directly and explicitly challenge the hegemony of capitalist economies and the state system itself. Both were drafted at the first People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth in Cochabamba, Bolivia in 2009, and then were presented to the UN Dialogues on Harmony with Nature in 2011. Now context is important here. So Bolivia was the host of this conference, and this is around the same time as they brought in their Mother Earth law. Uh, and President Evo Morales was the, the sponsor of this conference as well. You can see pictures of him at this conference. Also, the UNFCCC process at the time was teetering on the brink after the failure of negotiations at COP15 in Copenhagen. For Earth-based governance models to become norms, much would have to change in terms of political power, structure of the global economy and international norms. Well, I've argued all along through this subject that all of those things are in dynamic flux right now. We're in this time of transition. So these norms and practices are evolving. But what about specific cases that are pushing this evolution along, particularly in relation to First Nations peoples? Uh, there's a few cases that I'd like to mention. First of all, in Australia, you've got the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which calls for a model of joint sovereignty between Indigenous peoples in the Crown. And that builds on the Mabo and Wick High Court judgments of the 1990s, which secured some native title rights to Commonwealth land for Indigenous nations, although that was well short of a treaty. But it was the starting point uh, for recognising Indigenous sovereignty from a legal sense. In Canada, the Idle No More movement calls for peaceful revolution to honour Indigenous sovereignty and to protect the land and water. In Brazil, Indigenous forest peoples are mobilising international support to combat rampant deforestation that threatens their homelands in the Amazon.
something that's accelerated under the presidency of Jair Bolsonaro. In India, indigenous peasant farmers have been at the forefront of the largest protests in human history, demonstrating against recent government legislation which hands control over food markets to corporate agribusiness. In 2016, an international social movement coalesced around the Standing Rock Sioux Nation in South Dakota in the United States. The Sioux Nation were protesting the construction of an oil pipeline through their reservation across the Missouri River. The struggles of the Sioux Nation to protect the Standing Rock Reservation became politically significant globally because it rallied support from First Nations and non-Indigenous allies from around the world in solidarity, and in the process formed new political alliances across the global climate movement. So this international networking issue and issue linkage across allied social movements is of great interest to international relations specialists. And we'll come back to this issue linkage and, and social movement dimension next week. I've argued many times across the subject, this moment is a time of transition and dynamic change in international politics, where power relationships are evolving, where old assumptions are again up for grabs, and where the window of opportunity for new governance models is ajar, the doors open. What's possible in politics and international relations is in flux. Climate change impacts are also a driver here. Economic inequality is a factor, as is the COVID-19 pandemic and the decline of the United States as a global hegemon, among many other factors that are coalescing in this moment to create a window of political opportunity for new things to emerge. Now, I'm not sure what's coming next, whether it's a sustainable utopia or an authoritarian dystopia or something in between. I do believe, though, that possibilities for different models of governance are open in a way that they haven't been during the more settled periods of power and hegemony over the last 200 years. I think what we're living through is a death of the colonial world order. And the economic model of this system is not sustainable, either from an inequality perspective, from an ecological perspective, which is what we've covered in this climate change subject, uh, and from a social perspective in the dislocations that it's creating. The political hierarchies of this order are under challenge, and the institutions of this order also don't seem to be up to the task for 21st century, century Anthropocene problems. So in our final video for Poll3 IPC next week, we're going to explore how global networks of social movement actors are playing, playing an increasingly important role in striving for climate justice and pressuring governments and international institutions towards stronger climate action and post-carbon transition.